Thank you everyone for joining us this uh, morning or afternoon or evening, depending on where you are in the world, um, to one of these web, uh, innovative community webinars. Uh, and Susanna is joining us today to take us through design-driven data. Um, so Susanna, going to hand over to you. Hey everyone, uh, Susanna Summers here. I am joining y'all from Boston, Massachusetts. Um, I it's funny because I I actually submitted this pre-pandemic. Um, and in putting this together the very last minute, um, it, it completely changed um, a lot of what I'm going to be talking about and how we're using data and design together to tell stories. Um, to get started, um, so I'm an administrator of educational technology integration for a district just right next to Boston. Um, I also, this last year, I founded uh, ConnectHub.io as my innovator project. Um, and just before I did that, I also became a diehard Bachelor TV show data aficionado. I know, don't roll your eyes. It's a horrible TV show. Don't watch it. But I promise there's a reason why I'm mentioning it. So um, a little bit about my story. I am very non-traditional in how I get to where I'm going. So um, looking back towards high school, um, I started my first semester and did horribly. I tanked. And then it was a hustle for me to get to college. I got into University of Texas. From there, I also flopped. I changed majors about five, six, seven times until I found what I wanted to do. Um, I got to tinker in a lot of different subject areas that ended up driving my passion of where I am. Um, I became a third grade teacher. I graduated with um, an undergrad in uh, education. I became a third grade teacher, looped up to fourth grade. Um, I then met a guy that brought me to Boston and became a tech specialist. I said, hey, well, we went one to one in grades in grade four. So um, yes, I, I actually did the super senior year. It took five years to graduate. Um, I see that in the chat. Um, when I moved to Boston, though, I found so much passion in education with technology integration that um, I decided to apply for a tech specialist position that then eventually morphed into an ed tech director, which is where I am now. Um, so that is important in talking about my design and data journey. So I also am one of those people that I rapidly change what I'm doing quickly. So kind of like the Google philosophy of throwing enough stuff at the wall to see what sticks. Um, so that leads me to December 2018. Um, I have watched The Bachelor for a number of years that I don't care to admit. It is my <laughs> side, just, just dis disconnect from work. Um, and I was always really interested in what the impact of the TV show and the narratives have on social media, because so many people are going on these reality TV shows, not for the purpose of the show, but to get Instagram followers to then become an influencer. So I am fully outing myself right now on Reddit. I decided to use the Bachelor subreddit as a community to start collecting data on the contestants. So there was a season that was going to be starting in January. It was Colton Underwood season. And I decided to, yes, manually start tracking Instagram followers daily to see what happened after an episode aired that impacted followers. So was it airtime? Was it race? What was it that, dr that drove those followers? Um, so <laughs> this kind of got out of control. What I learned is that people don't like to look at spreadsheets as much as I love them. So I started to explore Google Data Studio and how we display data, the different ways to show it. Um, I also found my tribe on Reddit. Um, Reddit is an online forum if you haven't heard of it. And I started posting on it and the, the server was actually pretty small at the time. It's now over 100,000 subscribers. But the, the feedback that I got was huge in my data process and understanding the data that I was collecting. So not only did people get really excited, but people started giving me suggestions in how I look at the data. Um, these, this is in um, user design. It's called dog fooding. So it's like so good that you would eat your own dog food. Um, and I lived on this data because there's nothing worse to me than having to sit and stare and look at state testing data. Those spreadsheets have hundreds of columns. They don't make sense. They're ugly. They're not fun to work with. This was simple. It was date and number of followers. That's it. And there was so much you could do with that. 
And through this process, I found it's not just great to be able to post a picture of a graph, but then with Google Data Studio, actually to make interactive graphs for people to go and play and tinker with the data that normally would be scared of it. Most people, you send a spreadsheet and they're just like, oh, okay, I took a look at it. But this was really something they could change the date ranges, they could play with it and tinker with it without the fear of seeing a spreadsheet. So that then started to morph. So looking back here, this was my first one. It was horrible. The colors are bad, hurts my eyes to look at. Not that great in terms of user design. It was really long, you had to scroll so much. So I started to really tinker with that design with feedback. I also had Google Analytics set up on it. I really like data. I'm just going to put that out there if that isn't clear yet. But using Google Analytics to drive what were people looking at on these different Google Data Studio pages and what the bounce rate was to see what they were interested in. Um, and my design evolved from there. And now, over the last five or six months, I've taken the next step. So I was making Google Data Studios, and now I'm really starting to go over into the artistic side of how we represent data and show it. I started an Instagram account for bachelor data, really outing myself here. Um, <laughs> but it's crazy. I did this just for the end of the most recent bachelorette season. And in the course of four weeks, I hit almost 800 followers with absolute, I mean, there was a little bit of this being shared on Reddit, but people were as you can see over here, tagging their friends, saying things like, this page is speaking the language of my heart. Who says that about data? <laughs> People normally don't. I mean, some of us are diehards, but being able to show data in an easy to understand way to see stuff that you're interested in is has become a really fun journey that I found also is moving over into my professional life as very uh, helpful. So. Visualization. Um, I actually discovered last year, this is actually my brother's job. He works in uh, UX and UI, so user interface and user experience uh, whenever they go to a website. And there's so much science behind it. It's so interesting. But what I found with data, it's cool and all, but it can't happen unless you really know your data and you really know how it suits your job. Um, state testing data, as much as I love it now, it's not easy to thoroughly know it. And this is what I really want to get to in a data journey. You want to find something that you're passionate about and really understand. And let me tell you, when it comes to The Bachelor, I really understand it. And I really like Instagram. So this was a really, it was a marriage of two things that really worked for me. Um, oh my gosh, Tom, you didn't. <laughs> All right, so your data journey. First things first, start with your passion. So find data that you actually enjoy and understand. Don't choose state testing data unless you're that person. Um, but find fun and easy data. And next, start to get comfortable with spreadsheets and raw data. When I started this, I thought that I was really good with spreadsheets because I could do equal sum and then drag that cell down. I was like, oh yeah, I know spreadsheets. I really did it and I still don't. Um, but you'll learn so much by playing with simple data and then trying to do things with spreadsheets. So for me and my bachelor data it was trying to rank the contestant, the contestants, because I didn't want to have to sort them every day by highest to lowest and then write that over to Reddit. So then I learned the rank formula and different things from there. So design driving your data and data driving your design. We're going to go back and forth today when we're talking about it. So. I'm actually going to be using data that uh, my original plan was to use data that I used last year, but this was a major project that I've done over the course of closures. Um, just a little bit of background. My school district is uh, over 50% free and reduced lunch. This has been a very difficult time for um, us teachers and us administrators and, you know, not only getting food to our students, but losing them right now, socially, emotionally, and academically. Um, but the biggest problem is that we have thousands of students and we don't have a centralized way to track, do they have a device, do they have internet, and how engaged are they? It was being done in silos, it was too vague at some schools, and it didn't benefit the teachers to go into yet another spreadsheet every day to put in information on their students. So when we started talking about how do we um, fix this equity problem, right now with school closures, um, there was a lot of guesstimating. 
And I had a lot of principals coming to me saying, yeah, you know, I'd say about 12 to 15% of our students don't have internet at home. And I looked at our census data because here in the United States, we had a census data collected um, between 2012 and 2016, I think. And the census data for my city was actually closer to eight to 9%. So my solution was to create spreadsheets for each school that had the data validation that they could just go in and pick from a drop down menu, make it really simple for them. And the benefit was you do this now. And at the end of the summer, before you see your students, you're going to get your class list with this information from your students last year. So it benefit them to fill it out. They also knew that we were working on a solution to get every single student a device and every single household a personal hotspot for them to use with unlimited Internet. So there was a lot of incentive there on the student side for them to help their students and then for them to help themselves. And then for me, I had concrete level data so that when I went to school committee and to the city council, I could say, this is our exact situation. Now, when I started collecting that data, I did it wrong. I didn't think ahead in my story. So I just wanted to know how many people don't have internet. But what I didn't think is, what is the story I'm going to be trying to tell about this inequity problem that we have? Now, luckily, I didn't have to re-pull all the data. I used a VLOOKUP formula, which if you haven't heard of VLOOKUP, do yourself a favor this week. Google it and learn it, and it will be a lifesaver, and you're going to blow everyone's mind at work. What VLOOKUP does is it takes your uh, current spreadsheet and allows you to merge information from another spreadsheet using something like a student ID or something that's uh, concrete. You know, not like something that people have to fill out manually. Um, so this was my initial data I got. Who has access to internet? Who has access to device? And what's the student engagement? This was great. This wasn't that great for my story, though. So then I started to look at who was impacted. So luckily, with that beautiful VLOOKUP formula, I was able to pull over their English language learner status, their low income status, and all of this, uh, this data on the students to be able to tell a story here on who's really suffering right now during the pandemic from not having access. Um, and what this showed was it's our ELL students, it's our low income students, and it's our Spanish speaking students. Our 504 students luckily haven't been um, impacted as badly, but there is a higher portion of our IEP students that have been impacted. This was really helpful in my story. And we're going to jump into storytelling at the end. Last, I took their home address. This is a really cool new feature of Google Data Studio. You just take the cell of the home address and you can filter up here by internet access or no. And what this showed is actually a really big problem in our city that they're working on right now is the fact that the south side, that's where I live, is an area where there's a lot of poverty and a lot of students that are really needing help. So they're also working on the city side on 5G access around the city. Um, so this was really helpful in those conversations. So finding your tribe, this is the really important part. And this is what helped me in my big story about inequity and access. So when you find your tribe, getting their feedback is huge because you get so wrapped up in your data that you don't see the problems with it. Um, I'm gonna point out also a lot of the examples I'm giving you, I'm gonna talk about later things that I did that was wrong. So this is something that I did wrong to get started with when I first started showing this information. My digital learning team, they're my tribe when it comes to student data in our district. I share any graphs or data studios with them and they will spend hours on it, dissecting with it, playing with it, trying to figure out how to use it in their own situations. And what they found here is that as soon as I showed it, they were like, what does this mean? So 504 students are really impacted, aren't they? They're not. But the presentation of this data shows it because colors are important. Now, you can see here the way that I've ordered it. The first one shows 504 status, and it looks like a lot of 504 students are impacted. But when I threw this out to my team in our, we use Hangouts chat, it immediately, some of my best data people were like, wait, I don't get this. Maybe I'm tired. They weren't tired. It was 830 in the morning. My data was bad because the way that I had the colors set up, it didn't make sense. Blue is no 504. Five is that they have a 504. 
this was really bad on me to put this this color first where they wouldn't understand it. Um, so this back and forth in your tribe is huge because you spend so much time on the data visualization is that they will see it and give you their immediate gut reaction. So finding that tribe that of people that are equally as obsessed in the dog fooding that I mentioned will help you out tremendously. With my bachelor data, this was also exceptionally helpful. So I posted um, about a contestant that was clearly buying followers on Instagram. And immediately somebody posted a color man's a colorblind man's nightmare, to which I ended up learning that actually it's almost 10%, it's 9.2% of men are actually colorblind. And it's mostly red and green issues. So first off, Christmas is apparently very difficult for colorblind men. But don't use red and green. And if you have to, there are some ways around it. So there's actually this whole color philosophy out there that you'll learn about as you start to share your data. I'm gonna jump over here because I see a lot of questions coming in. Um, yes, data, the color and order are huge and it will really impact you later on in your stories. Um, so when it comes to color tips that I should actually follow more often and I did not, um, so far in the examples that I showed you. Chill on the oversaturation of colors. This is really bad. I'm so guilty of this. I was an elementary teacher. I, I was actually one of those elementary teachers that puts colors all over their room. That's not good for data visualization. Reduce the cognitive load on your audience. And we're going to jump into that in a minute. And then be cautious of predisposed feelings towards colors. So what does that mean? Here, cut the cognitive load. So this has a bunch of different meanings. This example in particular, so we're talking about that student engagement data, this is our high school. Um, the cognitive load and double encoding. So what I'm doing here is I already have a bar graph that tells me minimal, no activity, no contact, somewhat very active. But I've also put this over here. And what this does is it exhausts your users to look at three focal points whenever they go to analyze your data. And this will really impact how they flow through your data and the story that you're trying to tell. But don't worry about the cognitive load unless you're using one graph to tell a story. So this is an Instagram account that clearly I'm obsessed with. They're all about making information beautiful. Now, they're, what they do though is they focus on one graph to tell a story. So cognitive load can actually be good in this type of situation, as long as you're consistent about the story you're trying to tell. So here they have about three to four colors. Um, there's a whole color philosophy out there with graphing. Um, they've actually done studies that show that seven colors is actually best for graphs and one color is worse. Um, people will not remember graphs, the lower number of colors they have, unless it's part of a bigger story. Next, reduce saturation. So reducing saturation not only helps that cognitive load, but you can also use that to your advantage to call attention to the data you're trying to store, tell a story about. But again, be careful. Like I said, um, color charts are least memorable with one to two colors. So this is really helpful if you're trying to tell a really impactful story on maybe something like inequity, or if you're looking, um, Info Beautiful does a lot of stuff on, um, like suicide rates dropping around the world or, um, you know, about toilet access increasing around the world. So it, it depends on the, the story that you're trying to tell. And then be cautious of predisposed feelings towards colors or use it to your benefit, which is what I did. Um, so you have to be careful to not use it in the wrong situation. So I love the color red. It's a color that I have in my wardrobe a lot and I tend to err on the side of, but you have to be cautious when looking at things like uh, inequity, if you're saying yes versus no, well, normally green and red are what you associate with go and stop. So sometimes people will do that. If you switch it up, it might work against you. So order of data helps your understanding. So this was actually the graphic I showed my team when they were first like, what's going on? I, I don't get this. So a lot of 504 students are impacted. The order of this really helps you and telling your story. So I'm gonna switch it up. Oh, maybe I'm not. <laughs> I thought I had a slide next. What I ended up doing for our presentation, and we have another one tonight actually at school committee, it's gonna be a great day today. Gonna be up till midnight tonight. 
is that I actually switched this order. So I had ELL students first, followed by low income, because I wanted to show that ELL students were impacted. But then when you look at low income status, that was the, the bigger population that was impacted. And then I cut out 504 status because it didn't help with my story. But I put IEP at the end to show that they are also impacted, but not as widely as these other subgroups. That also helped us with looking at different title funding that we could look at for su supplementing the cost for internet access and devices. That's my cat in the background. My apologies, I hope you guys can't hear that. <laughs> so data-driven data design, the number one blunder, education loves pie. Pie graphs are everywhere in education, and I'm so guilty of this. And you're gonna see, I, I am going to be a hypocrite about a lot of the things I'm saying, because Pie graphs aren't always great, but you have to think about your audience. So I know my audience that I was presenting to this data and trying to convince them that they needed to let us transfer these funds to purchase it. And I knew that pie graphs in this situation would really help us. That being said, when I was pulling this data to talk to the high school about student engagement during closures, closures this was way more impactful because what this graph does is it allows us to compare apples to apples between our schools. So how you use this data and how you show it will really help, again, the narrative that you're looking at, but also it might help you find things that you didn't see in your own data. Um, so be careful of to using way too many pie graphs. Let's see. Just catching up on the, the comments. Yes, reddit.com backslash r slash data is beautiful. That is the best subreddit. You'll find so much interesting data on there. I'm a big fan. Um, so your data journey. We found your passion, how to get started, find your tribe. Now we're going to talk about upping your tool game, graduating from Sheets to Google Data Studio, and telling stories with it. So when I was working on my bachelor data, um, I eventually moved from using Google Sheets to Google Data Studio because what I started to find was that I would post about bachelor data and I would then get hundreds of comments that would require me to go back and filter things a little differently to be able to post links to photos for them to see. And what I found is that instead when I moved to Google Data Studio, which is this spectacular tool from Google, it's free, it's really easy to use as opposed to some other options out there for data visualization. Um, it allows you to publish these beautiful studios that people can just go in and click on filters to easily, easily manipulate everything on the page. And what that did is that it made it so, so people could go and play with the data and become even more fascinated with it. I don't think I included the screenshots of the comments, but there were, as soon as I started posting those out, um, people started to go in and play with it and then posting data that they had found with my own filters that I didn't even see myself. And once you do that, once you up your tool game to allow users to play with it, that's when you really need to start thinking about the story that you're telling with your data. So we all know the classic story arc, and there's a lot of magic whenever you use that tension, kind of like in a good story, to build the unrest of your audience to get them to want to solve your problem. Now that's really fun in Bachelor world, but it's really useful in your job for trying to convince people that there's a problem, um, especially right now in my case, in my district, we knew that internet was a problem. That was the first thing we heard about within a few days of us closing was, my kids don't have internet. How am I supposed to do this? They're using their cell phones. They don't have data plans. Their data plans got shut off. Um, having that story to tell, when you go to try to convince people that something's a problem, it, how you tell that story will get people in their minds to want to solve that problem. So my own story that I told with my own school committee. So solutions, we did, we had solutions early on. They were, um, you know, the Comcast low cost internet. Um, there were local hotspots that were difficult to get to for our students, explaining why they didn't work. And then talking about the data we collected, but then really talking about what we found in that data. And then I pulled it together with our teacher survey that we took on the biggest barrier in education with re remote learning. And then at that point, I had convinced them that we have a really big problem because I painted this story with the data 
and I'd pulled in uh, feedback from teachers, so quotes and stories to be able to tell on the problems that they were having. And then I pulled in this teacher survey data saying over 90% of teachers when surveyed in Waltham Public Schools said that device access and internet were the number one learning. Here's the solution you found. And as you start to tell them about this solution, they're like, oh yeah, this is great. And then they have seen the map about where the students are so they understand why we can't use hotspot buses because we're so dense here and they only go up to 300 feet. And then at that point, you're wanting them to get to that point of like, okay, we have these hotspots. So they're expecting we're gonna ask for those hotspots. But at this point, you've told this big story to get them really wrapped up in it, kind of like a roller coaster. So I really like about this graphic here that when it got to my request for a massive transfer of funds, it wasn't a surprise for them. And they were so invested in this story that it was successful. Now, what's important when it comes to that storytelling, though, is that it's important to know who your audience is. I had school committee and I had my city mayor on it. So I had to think about who did I have? What have they said in the past? What have they been passionate about to tell that story and to design my data around it? And then my big idea, because I was trying to talk about how access was a really big problem. So what you need to do is make sure you're conveying that unique perspective, but also communicate what's at risk. So last but not least, and I'm going to jump into the chat to take questions um, or let anybody else share, is going beyond. So this is where I've really been for the last six months or so. Um, so once you really start getting comfortable with that data and you're going to start putting in graphics and messing with color, you're going to actually find that there's a whole art side to this. I'm not an art artist. I'm not a data specialist. I'm not at all trained in any of this. But when you start seeing good data out there, you start getting really excited about what's possible and going beyond the traditional way that we show data. So these are very three very cool examples. The first one's Irish whiskey sales. And each line is the month of the year. So it starts January down to December. It's really interesting as the year goes on how those the intake of Irish whiskey sales goes. Next is the Breaking Bad data. I haven't done this, but I really want to do this now. Anybody watch Breaking Bad? One of the best. It just got better and better as each season went on. Um, and then the last one is from that uh, Data is Beautiful uh, Instagram account and how you show that data. Now, with my own story, I'm really embarrassed to show this. This is my initial, my minimum viable product of my uh, coaching platform that I launched as my innovator project. I'm not proud of my initial data visualization. I look back on it and I cringe and it still looks a lot like that. And what has happened through this third side project, through my innovator project, is that it's really started to push me on the user experience and the interface side of how does your data look and how easy is it for people to understand and manipulate? So this is a partial mock-up from a few weeks ago of our new coaching dashboard that we're gonna be launching. And I use this website called Dribble for inspiration. It's wonderful. You can just browse through to see a lot of user interface um, inspiration and you can filter and search. And I'm not creative. This is, this is not my jam. This is actually, my brother's whole job is around this. And I didn't realize that in the real world, there's actually people hired that are solely user experience and then other people that are solely user interface. Um, and there's this whole world out there about how the flow of your data helps tell that story, but also engages users as they go down this, the, the page. So um, the big thing I want to put out here is that your first shot at it, it's not going to be great. It's going to get better, um, but keep going with it. So the tools I use just to backface, and then I'll, I'll jump into the comments for Q&A. Um, I use Google Data Studio, highly recommend. Google Sheets, uh, a great starting point. But my two big tools, Canva is what I use now for my artistic side of data visualization. I'd seen it before, but man, is it a good tool. I actually did all this data here in Canva. I didn't use spreadsheets. I just copy pasted all of my numbers over. Um, and then I use Dribble. So Dribble's that, it, it is three Bs. 
Um, and it's that website you can browse for user um, interface in, uh, inspiration is the word I'm trying to get at. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and jump in now to uh, the comments. Anybody have any questions or want to jump on and share their, their own experiences with data? Oh, thanks, Sarah. It's definitely, it's been a journey. I didn't realize how much work it would be, but it's really helped me grow in a lot of areas. Hey, Susanna, fellow uh, Reddit lurker uh, here, Kevin Rossiter. Um, you know, Don't I'm, I'm really trying to, <laughs> I'm, I'm, you know, I really want to leverage um, data visualization as much as possible for a lot of the the teachers and admin in, on my site and district. And, and I love what you've been able to do with Connect Hub and um, the, the idea of starting with what you love to play around before you go into what you need. Uh, I think my big challenge, and maybe kind of you can speak a little bit to this, is I, I want to centralize all of where my data is into one spot and then be able to decide what data I want to use from there. And, and I find myself trying to bring too much data together instead of being really focused. Um, what, what, what are your kind of, um, I, I don't know, just kind of walk me through what you would like recommend or like how you would kind of approach a, a problem like that, where you have so much information that you want to leverage, but don't know how you want to collect it in what format, you know, whether it, you know, how, how to leverage it as opposed to simply yes or no questions or actual numeric data or, you know, yeah. so how, do you, how do you kind of put together your mindset towards that? Yeah, so as far as as too much data versus too little data to get started with, the good news is is that Google Data Studio has a blend data tool that kind of works like VLOOKUP. So if you get started with data, and um, actually, uh, Caitlin, I think, jumped into the chat before she left. I have two mentees from the NYC cohort. And we were actually working with similar data where it, I think it was actually Kara. She was collecting this data on internet access, but then she had a separate spreadsheet and she had to do something similar, like merging them together. But she had already started on one project with them. So it, it is possible with Data Studio to build back on it. Now, unfortunately, what you're going to find is that the way to collect the best data and how to figure out how to collect that best data is going to be through failing. Because what you're going to do is you're going to collect data and figure out what works and what doesn't work. One of the first things that really frustrated me when I tried to go from the bachelor world to the education world is I was trying to use data that I was collecting on Google Forms. It's a really great way to collect form, collect data. The problem is, is whenever you use checkboxes, that doesn't go over to Data Studio well because of the order of the answers and how many they're checking. But that took me messing up my data to learn it. Um, I'm sure there's programs out there that specialize in, in how to figure out how to collect the best data. I probably should go back for my master's and my PhD, but this has kind of been my path is, is the trial and error and then using websites. So luckily you're on Reddit, so you know there's a lot of community aspect there, even if you're a lurker. I'm really asking you don't out me. I just stepped down from being a moderator from The Bachelor some. <laughs> and there are some intense people on there, let me say. Um, but it's really trial and error, but then finding your tribe, because what you're going to find is that there are going to be people equally as obsessed with you. Here in Massachusetts, we have Laura Tilton, who is amazing. She is a data studio wizard. I see people nodding that don't even live here. Um, and her, she, I, I brainstorm off of her all the time. We jump on, on a Google meet and talk for 15 minutes and she solves all my problems in the world and how I'm looking at that data. Um, but don't, don't hesitate to reach out to people, but don't be scared of failing. You're going to collect bad data. My first go at visualizing our MCAS data, which is our state testing. I look back on it now and I made it so difficult on myself because I didn't get Data Studio at the time. I was uh, trying to do sub data with uh, like the grade level and then the, the skill topic. And I spent hours messing with my data because I didn't understand raw data and how to play with it in Data Studio. So you'll, you'll find what works as you tinker with it, but start with something simple um, and a project that doesn't hinge on hundreds of thousands of dollars. Like, a big project like right now that I'm working on. I couldn't imagine having to start with something like what I did now um, back when I was starting, but those errors that I made helped me get here. No, thanks for that. Two insights. One, thank you for the warning on checkboxes. I'm a checkbox aficionado. So that, that hurt to hear, but I needed to hear that. Um, but secondly, I, I appreciate the mindset of like, generally we think of the data first and then 
how to use the tool with that data. But kind of what I'm hearing is think with the tool first and then use that mindset to think about what data you're going to collect so that you can use it more effectively with the tool. So that, that was a big kind of takeaway for me from that conversation. So thank you for that. It'll be a back and forth too. So I, I know I, I think I originally called this data driven design, but it, it's really both and it, it's sometimes back and forth. Like right now during the pandemic, I've been a mess. I'm pretty much the only one on my administrative team without kids. So I've been taking on curriculum. I've been taking on facilities. I have three teams. I'm library, digital learning and infrastructure and data. So I've been managing not only my department, but further. And if I had had more time on this project, I probably would have thought through my story first, but it was more so I need this data, give it to me. And I was smart enough to think, make sure I put the student ID in there in case I need to pull more data from our student information system. Like I ended up needing their ELL status, their home address, their all of these different things. Um, I probably would have thought that through better early on because I would have been thinking, we have a problem. I'm going to need money from school committee. So how can I convince them with knowing who's probably impacted? Because I live on the South side. I know who's impacted because I see them out on the streets right now. I know these kids. So I probably would have done better, um, but learn the tool first before you try to cr create great data um, whenever you're thinking about that. Jump into the chat. Yeah, love hate relationship with checkboxes. I really wish that's one of my peeves right now. I loved awesome tables. If anybody's heard of that tool was such a great tool, but now they're charging $600 a year per awesome table you make if you get over 100 views on it. And what I loved about uh, awesome tables is that you could use checkbox data to filter because of because of the commas. So I really hope that's something that Data Studio will bring in soon. Um, Stephanie, I see you have a question. Um, I get taught from administrator level talk is what story does to, t yep. Yeah, so, it, and that's the, the, the question here, is it the chicken or the egg? And that, that's actually a problem sometimes is that if you're trying to tell a story, you might collect the data biasly uh, or in a biased way. And um, that's something important to, to take into account, but the story can sometimes help you find data that you're not looking for. So that's something I found on the Bachelor subreddit is that, you know, once I put the data studio out there, people were finding data in my, or they were finding trends in my data that I wasn't even finding. Um, so that's actually led now to, I'm working on a big race uh, study. It's my way of studying academic about the reality TV. Um, on the total number of followers, so the most followed people and their race, because we know there's a race problem on The Bachelor and there's so much bias there. There's so much, um, there's a lot of racism within Bachelor Nation, especially like the, the followers of the show. You guys totally know this lingo. Um, there's a lot of racism in the people who follow this show and people that they choose to follow. Um, a really good example is that over the last 10 years, we've only had one back, black bachelorette and she's the only person who doesn't have over a million followers. She only has like 700,000 followers, whereas every other bachelorette has a, at least a million to over 2 million. Um, so it, it's, it depends, like you'll find information or you'll find data there that you're not looking for. Picto chart. So canvas versus pick a chart or Canva versus Picto chart. I'm not a huge Picto chart fan. It's really good for making um, like graphics to like we used uh, Picto chart to make a uh, best practices for students with Google Meet at the beginning of closures. Canva is really good. A, I love it because it's great for making social media content for like Instagram and Twitter. Um, but it also has embedded uh, bar graphs, pie charts that just make it really simple to move it over there. I don't, I'm not good with colors. I'm not an artist. I try to be creative. I'm really not. So I really rely on Canva in their color palettes versus if I were to do it in Google Sheets or Google Data Studio, there aren't a lot of really great um, palettes there.
trying to catch up on the chat. Are there any more comments? Anybody want to jump on and talk about some data? Yes, I pay for Canva Premium, and it is I pay for it out of pocket. It is worth every dime. And yes, uh, analytics. Yeah, so Canva have got some teacher things around now, haven't they? So you could look at those as well if you're still teaching in the classroom. Uh, there's Canva for educators you can access. So some of you might be able to go on that route. Yeah. I want to show you guys, too. Um, I see here somebody mentioned about analytics on Instagram, and that has been in my process of moving towards uh, data visualization in a more artistic way. I made that Bachelor Data account a uh, business one, but that allows me to see the number of viewers on posts. So I can actually, I should probably see if you guys can actually see this. This is what the hashtag influencers can see. And on each post, you can see the number of views on it. And what I found is that people really like pie charts. Um, pie charts are really easy for them to understand. So I actually got, still baffles me, 25,000 views. I only have 800 followers, but uh, 25,000 views on the, the time allocation of hometown dates and who got the most time on screen. Um, so it was really interesting to see what people enjoy looking at and what gets shared a lot. Um, there's a lot of really great analytics that you can see on these posts. There's a question in about checkbox data. Um, yes. And now you can clean, if you've discovered you've made the mess, how can you clean the mess up? So you can do count ifs. It's gonna be a little messy. Um, so count if statements, you can say um, how much a combination of the checkboxes are answered, but it depends on how many checkboxes you have. So m remembering back to math permutations versus combinations, if that order matters to you in terms of calculating um, whether or not something was right or wrong, um, you can do a count if um, or a yeah count if and just combine them together to give them a quantity. So definitely jump. You can uh, here. I'll put it over here. Feel free to DM me on Twitter, and I can send you the formula to help parse those out. The other thing I would say is if you haven't used commas in your actual answers. You might be able to split the data that way. Yes. But if you've used commas in the in the actual text, it's going to break all that apart as well. In which case, you you are stuck. And don't use apostrophes either, because that will mess up your formulas. Um, if you do count ifs, if you have to use a, an apostrophe, but not quotations. Yeah, column for true false is also really helpful. Well, I'm going to leave my information up here. If you have any more questions or if you want to stay on to chat, I will be here. Um, as, we're, as we're entering Q&A phase, I'm going to stop the recording if that's all right. And then we can continue to have questions and answers if that's okay with everybody. Yes, Luis, I've seen that too. 